Throughout history, the visual language of art has proved to be an extremely effective means of communicating a point of view on social issues, and Chapter 4.7 is concerned with ways in which artists have used the power of the visual language of art to make people more aware of social problems, to spur people to become involved in certain issues, or even instigate social change by creating potent artworks that activate emotional responses. Many artists seek to use their works to shine a light on and combat social, racial, and environmental issues, and much more. We've already seen several examples of this theme throughout the semester and in other thematic lectures, particularly the identity lecture and the um, war and healing lecture, but here we will look at a few more um, a bit more specifically. Now we've already seen this painting um, when discussing some of the formal elements and principles of art. Um, but now let's talk about it again in terms of how it memorializes on a very grand scale um, a rather scandalous event in French history. Um, so this is Theodore Jaripo's Raft of the Medusa from 1819. Um, and so this is referencing an event that occurred on July 2nd, 1816. Um, the French naval vessel Medusa ran aground off the coast of West Africa. The captain and approximately 250 crew members boarded the lifeboats, but the rest of the passengers, about um, 146 to 150 people, um, were left on a makeshift raft that had been built from the wreckage. Now, initially, the lifeboats pulled the raft along, but the captain soon abandoned it. And so the survivors were left to battle starvation, sunburn, disease, dehydration. And in the end, only about 15 of them survived um, their, their time at sea. Um, some cannibalized their shipmates, and that was really the only way that they were able to survive. So Jericho's painting here really deals with the emotional intensity um, of the moment when the raft survivors are about to be rescued. Um, so if you remember, we discussed the um, implied diagonal lines that run sort of like an X through this composition. One of them leads us up to the right, and we see this tiny ship on the horizon uh, giving us this sense of hope, perhaps. Um, that we will be rescued. And then the other implied line leads us from the bottom right to the top left over towards this um, large wave that could come crashing down on the raft at any moment, sort of implying this impending doom or this danger that is not yet passed. Um, so he uses the elements and principles to arrange his composition in a way that um, that really heightens the intensity or the drama of this moment and produces a stronger emotional uh, response within the viewer. Now, Jericho interviewed the survivors of this event. He studied the corpses and he even had a replica of the raft built within his studio to prepare for the painting. Now, the survivors told him all about the despair and the madness that they felt when they saw a ship on the horizon on the 13th day. Now, they had seen ships in the distance before, but um, the ship's crews had not seen men. And so many feared that this ship too would disappear. But the survivors, all close to death, were rescued and they told the world about how they had been abandoned by their captain. Um, <clears throat> so Jericho's painting here, it criticizes not only the disaster, not only the shipwreck of the Medusa, but colonialism and slavery. Only one African survived the tragic journey, and Jericho here has installed him as the heroic figure or the powerful figure at the top of the pyramid of people waving his shirt in the air trying to get the attention of the ship on the horizon. Um, so this event occurred during a time in which French or excuse me, France had colonial power over, um, well, a lot of a lot of areas in Africa. But um, here specifically, we're referring to um, what is now Senegal. So that was French Senegal at the time. So 
um, this man would have been from Senegal and um, he was the only African to survive the journey and Jericho by making him the hero of this scene and and providing him with the opportunity to save all of these other people he is you know criticizing colonial power in general and and France's kind of imposition on Senegal and their other um, African lands. Somewhat similarly, the British painter J.M.W. Turner used his artworks to express his own views against enslavement and as a force for social protest. Um, this is a very dramatic painting that Turner created in the Romantic style, and it's titled Slave Ship, Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying, Typhoon Coming On. In this composition, Turner condemns the slave trade. Um, now, at this point in time, enslavement was illegal in Britain. However, Turner was highlighting the injustice of the trade and protesting any consideration of its renewal. The powerful canvas here portrays an infamous incident aboard the ship Zong in 1781. It was common practice for the captains of ships used to transport enslaved people to fill their vessels with more people than they would need, knowing that disease might spread amongst them. The captains knew that they would be paid for any enslaved peoples lost at sea, but not for those who were sick when they arrived, and so they threw sick people overboard while the ship was still very far from land. Turner's chaotic canvas displays several aspects of the Romantic style. Um, humans versus nature was a common theme in Romantic art, and here the immense power of nature expressed as this fierce storm overpowers the ship and the enslaved people that have been thrown overboard. Body parts still shackled and being attacked by sharp teeth fish can be seen in the central and right foreground. And Turner has used intense colors as well as turbulent brushstrokes to convey the heightened emotion and fearful horror of this event. The canvas also has a sort of abstract quality, making the subject matter a bit difficult to understand. Um, but beside the painting, when it was first shown, Turner placed a quotation from the book that inspired it, which was Thomas Clarkson's History and Abolition of the Slave Trade, in order to help viewers understand what the work was supposed to mean. Dorothea Lange's famous photograph of Florence Owens Thompson, known as Migrant Mother, was used to demonstrate the plight of the poor, and it remains a powerful symbol of the struggle against poverty. The photo was taken in 1936, when Florence and her children were living in the remains of a Californian pea pickers camp. Lange's image had an immediate impact. Um, this photograph was published in several newspapers and Time magazine, and the federal government sent 20,000 pounds of food to this camp after they had seen this photograph. Unfortunately, the Thompson family had already moved on. They had migrated elsewhere before the supplies arrived to the camp. Um, the photograph had an incalculable effect on people's understanding of the devastation of the Great Depression. Um, Thompson herself was always somewhat ashamed and irritated by the portrait, however. Um, to her mind, it never had a positive effect on her life. When the photo was taken, she was recently widowed, had six children, and worked wherever she could to support her family. The identity of Thompson was not discovered until 1978, and she was quoted as saying, I wish she hadn't taken my picture, and complained about never being compensated for it. Her experience raises questions about the role of an artist when depicting an actual event. To what extent should the subject's privacy be protected, and to what extent should they be compensated, if at all, when their image has demonstrable effects on social conscience? Um, more than 80 years after this image was taken, the photograph remains a memorable symbol of the plight of the poor, and since 1936, it has been published many times in books and newspapers and has been featured on U.S. postage stamps twice. Um, Dorothea Lang, the artist here, she was working for the federal administration, traveling around the United States, particularly in kind of the, the rural south, um, taking pictures of impoverished peoples to spread awareness of the impact of the Great Depression in this area. And so in one way, you know, her photograph was very successful. It did kind of raise awareness and ultimately it brought federal aid to the region. However, the individual that is featured in the portrait didn't necessarily see any of that aid herself. 
We already discussed the Iranian-born artist Shirin Neshat a bit in our identity lecture, um, but I wanted to include this image in this lecture as well. Um, and it is also from the Women of Allah series. Um, these are black and white photographs of armed and veiled Islamic women, and they are exploring Western stereotypes of Muslim women, as well as the women's religious and personal convictions. Um, these images are quite formally beautiful, and they show women as being powerful, and they sort of speak to the seemingly contradictory perception of Muslim women as being both suppressed and as soldiers of Islam. Um, in this particular image titled Speechless, we see the muzzle of a gun placed beside a woman's face, and at first it sort of appears to be an earring that she is wearing. Um, written on her face in Farsi calligraphy is text by the female poet Tahira Safarzeda, in which a woman addresses her brothers in the Iranian Revolution, asking if she can participate as well. Neshat herself was exiled from Iran, but she disagrees with Western interventions in her home country, and her works are meant to address the complexities surrounding the identity of Muslim women. Uh, so here we have a work that is perhaps somewhat similar. Um, this is the work of two French artists, J.R. and Marco, and together they create the group 28 Millimeters. This particular work is titled Face to Face, and it's from 2007. Um, and so within this work, they took photographs of Israeli and Palestinian people who held the same roles within society. Um, so they took photos of doctors, teachers, etc. And um, then they hung large images on the West Bank wall that divides Palestine from Israel. So oftentimes the photographs of the Israeli and Palestinian people show um, expressive kind of playful universal emotions like this. Um, and so it's sort of asking the viewers to consider the differences between the two groups. Um, residents on either side of the wall were quite entertained and intrigued by these photographs, and generally they couldn't tell who was Israeli and who was Palestinian. And so the goal here was to sort of highlight the similarities of the two groups and enable them to view each other as actual people instead of stereotypes. In 2017, JR did an installation at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, you know, he's thinking about borders and the arbitrariness of them and how oftentimes lives have been lost because of them. And so he has installed this very large scale mural. It's about 65 feet tall of a one year old Mexican baby um, sort of peering over the border wall here. Now this had been planned for a while, but um, it actually ended up being installed pretty soon after um, Trump had announced his plan to end DACA. Um, and it remained, um, it remained up for one month, and on the very last day, JR and his team hosted a picnic across the border. Um, so on the US side, there were tables. On the Mexico side, there were blankets, and this was meant to call attention uh, to economic disparities. Um, he included a photograph of DACA dreamer Mara's eyes. Her parents had entered the U.S. illegally, but she was a DACA dreamer, and so um, he sort of breached the barrier or the boundary with her eyes here. Um, people on both sides of the border were served the same foods. They heard the same music played by a band that was also split by the wall. Um, so sort of thinking about, again, how arbitrary borders often are, the only thing that is really separating these two groups of people is the border wall. Um, and without it, would we even know the border was truly there? 
Inspired by the ongoing immigration crisis at the American border, and in particular the separation of children from their parents, Ronald Rael and Virginia San Fratello built Teeter Totter Wall in 2019. Um, this was built at the site where a border wall separates Juarez in Mexico from El Paso in the United States, and the steel pink beams slice through that wall, literally and conceptually dismantling the separation of people that this wall enforces. The bright pink color was chosen to commemorate the suffering and murder of women in Juarez, but pink also has a childlike and playful connotation that contrasts strikingly with the very dark brown wall. The form of the teeter-totter requires interaction on both sides for play to take place, and this symbolizes the interconnectedness of the United States and Mexico. The wall was designed to highlight the interdependency between the two countries who need one another for balance in trade and labor. The human interaction created by the work reduces the foreboding impact of the border wall, which the artists hope will be dismantled completely. So now we have another artist, this is Pedro Reyes, and this is a work he began in 2007, but is still working on today. Um, and this is titled Guns for Shovels. So in an effort to create social participation in combat against the high number of violent deaths in Mexico City, um, Reyes created this public campaign in which the public donates firearms that are then melted down to make shovels. Um, so then Reyes took those shovels and planted 1,527 trees around the world, which was equal to the number of guns that were originally donated to him. Now, many of these shovels have been exhibited in galleries to raise awareness of the scale of the Mexican weapons trade. And then he continues to use donated guns as his medium. And he transforms these weapons from vehicles of violence to objects that can contribute to society. So tools like these shovels or just works of art in general, maybe musical instruments, um, things that will better the community around them. Teresa Margolis' installation in El Air is seemingly very peaceful, even playful, um, as you explore this room filled with bubbles. However, visitors are typically shocked when they learn that these bubbles have been made from the water that was used to cleanse the bodies of corpses. Um, using her experience as a trained medical examiner who worked in a morgue in Mexico City, the artist wishes to activate greater awareness of the large number of violent deaths in Mexico due to drug-related crimes. Margolis states that, quote, each bubble is a body, and she stuns space, um, creating this setting in which the visitor's body can become traumatized by the knowledge of the material used to make the bubbles. This trauma is necessary, Margolis argues, in order to trigger disgust and horror at the tragedy of the numerous violent deaths. Visitors to the exhibition are forced to acknowledge these deaths and then asked to become involved in working to prevent further murder. Contemporary Colombian artist Doris Salcedo draws inspiration from the political landscape of her home country with its history of civil conflict, unequal wealth distribution, and disruption from the illicit drug trade, as well as from the experiences of individuals affected by violence both in Colombia and around the world. Her pieces generally begin in the form of research, interviews, and careful listening to the stories of witnesses and those who have experienced trauma and loss, resulting from brutal social, political, and economic conditions. The intricate objects and installations she envisions are brought to fruition by a team of architects, engineers, and craftspeople. Salcedo sees her artworks as a collective act of mourning, completed when they are experienced by viewers. For many residents, Noviembre 6 y 7 calls to mind memories of the 1985 siege in their Supreme Court building. A guerrilla group called M-19 violently overtook the government building, and the Colombian army, who knew the attack would be taking place, retaliated with an equal amount of violence. Around 300 hostages were taken and over 100 people were killed, including rebels, soldiers, and Supreme Court justices. At 11.35 a.m. on the 7th 
17th anniversary of the seizure of the Palace of Justice, a chair was lowered on the facade of the new building to commemorate the moment the first guard was shot. For 53 hours, marking the duration of the building's seizure, 280 chairs were lowered at the times the individuals and groups of people died, according to the forensic reports and autopsies. The empty chairs serve as a poetic reminder of those who died on that day. Salcedo believes that this kind of memorial is important because while art cannot explain things, it can expose them. Um, this artist, Cheryl Rowland, this is his jumpsuit project, which he started in 2016. Um, he was a graduate student at UNC in 2013 when he was wrongfully arrested and imprisoned for more than 10 months. Um, and so he does this performance piece in which he just goes about his daily activities while wearing his orange prison jumpsuit. Um, so this act alters all of his interactions with other people, just the same as being in jail had altered his interactions. Um, he says that the jumpsuit triggers conversations about the prevalence and impact of false incarceration, especially for black males in America. Um, and so his goal is to raise awareness. He says incarceration happens every day. It could be anybody. It could be me today, but it could be you tomorrow. In the early 2000s, the term social practice was adopted from social theory to describe art that directly engages a community in confronting societal issues and challenges. In these works, collaboration, interaction, and impactful results building on the vision of the artist are more important than appearance, style, or medium. While aspects of the work may be brought into art museums or galleries, social practice art tends to exist in the neighborhoods where people live, and they evolve over time. The American conceptual artist Mel Chin challenges the traditional role of the artist and the expected outcomes of artworks by engaging specialists and the community to generate solutions for an important environmental issue in his Operation Pay Dirt Fundred Dollar Bill projects. After the devastation caused by Hurricane Katrina in 2005, Chin learned about the presence and severity of lead toxic soil in and around New Orleans and its effects, especially on children. Chen responded by initiating a collective art project that involves hundreds of thousands of contributors, including many school children, drawing their interpretations of $100 bills. The Fundred organization planned to make the money for the bioremediation of the lead toxic soil by requesting from the U.S. government the equivalent of the drawing's value in exchange for the needed goods and services. The organization continues to raise awareness of lead poisoning through Fundreds and to work toward municipal and government implementation of Operation Pay Dirt. In 2016, the Fundred headquarters moved to Washington, D.C. to be closer to policymakers. The organization also participated in the National Lead Summit to create a blueprint for action and ignite a national movement for the eradication of lead poisoning in the United States. In 2001, the Fundred Reserve housing nearly half a million fundreds was gifted to the Brooklyn Museum. So art clearly has the power to reflect societal issues, and it can, as in the case of this mural of George Floyd, become a touch point for protest and mourning. This mural was painted by a group of artists, including Zena Goldman, Cadix Herrera, and Greta McLean, at the site of the murder of George Floyd, who in 2020 suffocated when a Minneapolis police officer deliberately kneeled on his neck for over nine minutes. George Floyd is depicted in the center of the mural with the words, I can breathe now, written on his chest, recalling the words he spoke as he was dying, I can't breathe. Surrounding him, written in white on a black backdrop, are the names of other African-American victims of police violence, inscribed under the words, Say Our Names. In the letters of Floyd's name are figures pumping their fists into the air, signifying the Black Lives Matter movement, which was founded in 2013. The site here has functioned as a memorial and as a backdrop for news stories about Floyd's murder, as well as a hub for protests. 
The mural is recognizable worldwide at this point and has taken on the power of being a rallying cry to fight racial injustice. Along with the video showing Floyd's suffocation, the mural has urged society never to forget what happened. In June 2021, the former police officer who was convicted for Floyd's murder was sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison, and other officers um, went to trial later in 2022. As we can see, artists frequently make statements through their works, highlighting issues in society and making calls for activism. Keith Haring, whose fame rose from drawings he made in and around New York City subways, protested many social injustices. Um, he famously defended the rights of LGBTQ plus people, and in this work, Ignorance Equals Fear, he was fighting for government and community support to fight HIV, the virus that can lead to AIDS. By the end of 1990, the United States had over 100,000 AIDS cases, but many saw the disease as a form of divine punishment that targeted only homosexuals or drug addicts. Herring's poster highlights how the public need to educate themselves on how the disease spreads and speak out against homophobia. Herring died one year later of AIDS-related complications. The Keith Herring Foundation continues his work to prevent the spread of HIV and AIDS, fight the stigma towards LGBTQ plus people, and enrich the lives of underprivileged children through art. Uh, here you can see Herring standing next to his famous Crack is Whack mural in New York in 1986. Uh, the crack epidemic was also um, a big topic during the 80s and 90s. And so here he has um, kind of incorporated, you know, simple figures kind of piling. We can see um, drug paraphernalia. We can see flames kind of eating away at this dollar bill, except it's not worth a dollar. It's worth nothing. Um, and these skeletons all beneath his sort of simple and catchy um, phrase here. And then here you can see Keith Haring. Um, he's at an in apartheid rally in Central Park in New York City of 1985. Um, so he designed these posters. Uh, the text across the bottom there says free South Africa to um, protest the South African apartheid. And so at this particular rally, he, he designed the poster, he printed out numerous copies. You can see that he made a t-shirt as well, um, but then he's handing out all of these posters to the various um, attendees at the rally um, for them to use while they march.
During the South African apartheid between the 60s and the 90s, artists in this area had to find ways to survive in the increasingly oppressive state. Um, isolated in reservation-like rural areas, black women created murals, beaded clothing, and ceramics. And at the same time, artists of all backgrounds working in art schools, as well as in informal workshops that met illegally, addressed the harsh conditions that developed in this police state, often risking arrest and detention. Demille Finney was um, a South African artist who was born in Cape Town and then moved to Johannesburg in the early 1950s and then eventually fled South Africa in 1968 and died in poverty in New York City in the early 1990s. Finney was essentially self-taught, practicing his drawing skills with friends and exhibiting his work at private galleries. By the 1960s, his growing reputation, while earning him the support of influential white artists of the area, also attracted the attention of the authorities. After he sculpted a portrait of a well-known anti-apartheid activist in 1968, the South African police informed him that he must leave Johannesburg for a remote rural area. Um, to avoid arrest, he left the country and was frequently homeless and destitute thereafter. Um, toward the end of his life, the United Nations commissioned Finney to create a work of art for a campaign against child abuse, and the result was this huge charcoal drawing around eight feet tall titled Children Under Apartheid. Um, for many years, this hung on the wall in the UN headquarters in New York City, which um, the artwork itself is very sort of astonishing in its scale and in the stark clarity of the image. Um, the drawing expresses Finney's emotional response to the imprisonment, mistreatment, and death of young people at the hands of the South African state. The open mouths and furrowed brows of the children and the compression of the abstracted figures into the spaces divided by bars creates a strong visual impact. The artwork is a message of protest and outrage. Although it is Finney's specific response to the suffering caused by apartheid, it addresses the universal vulnerability of children, not only in Africa, but throughout the world as well. African Guernica is often considered Finney's most important work, and it was made shortly before his exile from South Africa. The work expresses the anguish he felt at the social and political disposition and dislocation that apartheid was forcing upon him. The reference to Picasso's iconic work Guernica made about 30 years earlier provides a context in which Finney's protest against the apartheid system mirrors Picasso's comment on the destruction caused by civil war. Both works here take the ruptured relationship between humans and animals as symbolic of the destruction and suffering wrought by war. Finney's rendering of the mutated and twisted animal figures and the equally manic energies of the human figures shows a world out of balance, an allegory of the conflict not only between the human and the natural world, the social and the cosmic, but between humans themselves, as the demented three-legged figure dominating the right side of the picture plane might suggest. Um, in many of his works, Demille uses a dislocation of space to develop his expressive content. Um, the figures tend to float in a sort of indeterminate spatial field, simultaneously moving away from the viewer and forward, kind of piling up against the edge of the picture plane, so the space of the composition is somewhat insecure. It seems that DeMille tended to reject a, a Western style perspective and instead um, favored this kind of indeterminate one, which many scholars posit was derived from ancient or traditional South African rock art created by the San peoples, in which we know that Finney was very interested. Um, in African Guernica, the spatial decentering is developed with these figures arranged in a sort of vortex around a central figure. Dumil engages the figures in this sort of macabre dance, um, and the expressive distortions of form, which are especially visible in the two figures on the right, um, kind of turn the participants into demonic creatures with domestic animals such as the horned cattle as their mounts, um, one of which, if you notice on the left, suckles a small child. Um, these images are strange, possibly even sort of 
nightmare-esque or carnival-esque. Um, but the priest figure seated at the table at the bottom center has often been interpreted as a self-portrait of the artist, and it shares a relative normalcy of appearance with the two figures that are embracing, placed across the central void above him. Um, these are encircled by deliberately shadowy figures of dancing and seated humans as well as animals, um, details of which are only visible in the original, not so much in reproductions like the one we're looking at. Um, the grotesque and distorted figures invoke ideas of defiance and abjection. They do not offer an overt comment on apartheid, but suggest a personal view of particular human conditions. Um, in Finney's African Guernica, we see exactly these tensions of an artist commenting on the insanity of reason that results in the oppression of one human being by another. The artist is blatantly recognizing this insanity of the white colonial racist rule, particularly under the South African apartheid, but also just in general. And he's also recognizing how in such a warped system, everyone loses their humanity. And he acknowledges how easy it can be for humanity to rationalize such violence and oppression. Um, a 2004 biographical essay authored by Bruce Smith describes Finney's work as thus. He says, quote, In drawing after drawing, Finney touches the nerve ends of our consciousness. The young artist's theme is the universal agony of man, rendered specific through his own experience in South Africa. His figures are frozen in a kind of agonized despair. In some cases, the twist of an arm, the sprawl of a leg, is as eloquent as a mask of pain for a face. At other times, it is as though the music of some wild ritual dance has suddenly stopped. Its dying note lingers in the heart." End quote. One of these artists was Willie Bester. Um, he was born in 1956 and his past book classified him as colored. Um, his mother was also classified as colored and his father was, um, his father was of Joksha heritage, so he was black. Um, but his parents were therefore in an interracial marriage and that caused a lot of um, difficulties for them. They had trouble finding um, you know, neighborhoods that they could live in, things like that. Um, now, Willie Bester showed an early affinity for art. He had very little official training, but he made toys from scraps um, and he drew from a very young age. In the 1980s, um, the community arts program in Cape Town, he started taking classes there and he started making what is called township art. So townships were very, um, very poor neighborhoods that were um, set up for black South Africans. They were often very dirty. They didn't have running water or plumbing. Um, and township artists, made artworks that reflected the realities of um, living within these places. And so oftentimes he created assemblages and sculptures using found objects and oil paint. Um, and these become rather dense retellings of the oppression, the injustice and the deprivation that these black South Africans are experiencing. So this particular work is titled Simikazi. It comes from a series that Willie Bester did in the 90s titled Migrant Miseries. Um, and so this is an assemblage that tells the story of a gentle, devout man from the crossroads township outside of Cape Town. Um, and the man's name is Simikazi. Now, he was an older man who rented a bed that was really his only personal space um, and that, you know, was within a house full of other people. And so um, Willie Bester was very moved by the experiences that Simakazi had undergone. Um, when he met him, as I said, he was an older man, and he had apparently recently found out that despite having worked for the same employer for many, many years, they were not going to give him his pension because according to a government listing, he was already dead. So because of the government's mistake, um, this man was essentially not going to receive his retirement funds. Um, 
Now, I mentioned he rented a bed. That was his only kind of private or personal space. Um, so notice in the center of this composition, we have um, sort of a bed spring that has been attached and oriented vertically so that it sort of looks like maybe um, maybe like uh, a cage or a prison door. And so from behind that door, we can see the face of Simakaze kind of peering out from between the bars. Um, and so this sort of speaks to the ways in which he's kind of trapped within this situation. Um, to the right of his portrait, uh, Willie Bester has included Simakaze's passbook, the ID that he was forced to carry everywhere. Um, and then he's also included other portraits of Simakazi's wife and children. Um, his wife and children lived elsewhere, and he only got to visit them for about three weeks each year. Um, he also includes wire, a bike wheel, and bits of trash to refer to Simakazi's job as a trash picker. Um, and then in the upper right corner, he includes text from a handwritten note of Simakazi's discussing his employer not giving him his pension money because he was already listed as being dead. Um, so the intensity of this kind of packed garbage covered surface is meant to communicate the artist's rage at the way that Simakazi was being treated by his employer and by society in general. Unfortunately, Simakazi was murdered just six months after Willie Bester finished this work. Here we have another of Willie Bester's works. This one is a tribute to the apartheid activist Steve Biko. Um, again, this is a collage or an assemblage created with found objects um, from the townships that are quite rich in symbolic meaning. Um, so on August 18th, 1977, Steve Biko, who was already a relatively well-known activist against the apartheid regime, um, but he was arrested at a police roadblock. Um, so notice on the left side of the canvas here, uh, Bester has incorporated a stop sign into the collage to reference uh, this particular event. Um, but after his arrest, he was interrogated and tortured by officers for 22 hours in police room 619. Um, he sustained head injuries that put him in a coma. And while he was in the coma, the officers loaded him into a policeman and transported him over 700 miles to a prison in Pretoria. Um, he died September 12th, 1977, naked and shackled in his cell. Now, the police claimed that his death was the result of a hunger strike that he was willingly undergoing, but his autopsy revealed multiple bruises and abrasions and that he ultimately succumbed to a brain hemorrhage from the massive injuries to his head. And many saw this as strong evidence that he had been brutally clubbed by his captors. And so since this, uh, Steve Biko has been seen as sort of a martyr of the anti-apartheid movement, and his death really served as a rallying point against the apartheid, both locally and nationally. And so Willie Bester here is uh, commemorating this man and his, you know, his attempts to stand against the apartheid um, government, but he's also calling attention to the atrocities and the tragedies um, that this man was subjected to. So we have a portrait of Biko in the center. His hands have been shackled together and he stands in front of a crowd of um, sort of stylized figures. They seem to look sort of like skeletons. Um, and then there are crosses all across the background. Again, the stop sign on the left side. And then just above that, you can see the police van that he was loaded into. And um, just to the side of it, there's a street sign uh, that says 1100 kilometers to Pretoria, which he's also repeated the phrase um, across the top of the painting there. Um, then notice on the right side of the painting, we have um, sort of a metal door that he has included, and it has been labeled room 619, which is where he was held and beaten 
Um, so again, the sort of densely compacted, chaotic surface of the work of art is meant to um, kind of symbolize different points in this narrative and call attention to the ways in which the apartheid was oppressing and um, sort of abusing black South African people. Sometimes artists and artist groups use their works to not only raise awareness, but incite physical action as well. Um, in North America, a federal law known as the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act was enacted on November 16, 1990 to legislate the repatriation of artifacts and sacred remains. According to the National Park Service, this act addresses, quote, the rights of lineal descendants, Indian tribes, and Native Hawaiian organizations to Native American cultural items, including human remains, funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony. Since the time of European contact in the Americas, issues of ownership have extended to include occupation, access, and treatment of the land itself. Still being contested in the courts as of 2021, the 2016 construction of an oil pipeline under the Missouri River in North Dakota drew a great deal of media attention. The Standing Rock and Cheyenne River Sioux opposed the Dakota Access Pipeline that developer Energy Transfer Partners was running through indigenous land because of its potential to harm their access to clean water necessary for life in both physical and spiritual ways. The situation came to a head on November 20th when police attacked unarmed protesters with rubber bullets, tear gas, and water cannons in sub-freezing temperatures. In response to the situation, artists made posters to raise awareness, sold artwork to donate to the Standing Rock cause, and made narrative videos telling the tale of a mythical beast devouring the natural world. In this case, the mythical beast was oil. One artist incited people to create mirror shields to be used on the front lines of the protest. Born on the Standing Rock Reservation, the artist Kanupa Hanska Luger of the Mandan, Hidatsa, Arikara, and Lakota, Austrian and Norwegian descent, Luger was inspired by Ukrainian activists to use mirrors as a way of drawing the oppressor's attention to their own actions. Actual battle regalia using mirrors as spiritual and physical protection can be traced back to the Bronze Age and in antiquity all over the world, including parts of Europe, Asia, and West. West Asia. Using social media, Luger shared directions for making mirror shields for water protectors, using inexpensive materials, and asked contributors to mail them to the camps. In an interview in the LA Times, Luger explained that artists, quote, live on the periphery, but we are the mirrors, we are the reflective points that break through the barrier, end quote. According to the artist, the mirror shields are, quote, designed to let them, the people reflected in the mirrors, know that we love them and they stand with water as well. The wall the mirror shields create is not a wall of division, but a wall of unity, end quote. Many artists also address environmental issues, sometimes lumping those together with social issues. Um, Vic Muniz made a series of artworks called The Wasteland Project, using the trash he found at the world's largest landfill located near Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The film Wasteland documents the people Muniz met for this project and the artworks they inspired. Muniz spent time with the catadores, people who survive by going through the trash looking for items to recycle. Discarded waste is, by definition, material that is considered useless and unwanted. The people who live at this landfill are also treated as discarded members of society. Muniz took this rejected material and arranged it on his studio floor to create large-scale portraits showing the beauty of the human spirit. The artworks were then photographed from high above. Um, this image shows a woman who worked at the landfill every day, um, and she was always smiling and bringing joy to those around her. The shadows and features of her face are made with old shoes, bottle caps, and computer keyboards. Her scarves are made of plastic bottles designed to hold everything from detergent to gasoline, and the arms, legs, and heads of dolls. Her earring is made of used hoses, and the lighter portions of her skin and some of her clothing are actually the bare floor of the warehouse in which Muniz worked. 
Munez's portraits bring to light the impact our combined trash has on society. The trash doesn't disappear, but instead becomes a burden for others. So this particular work by the artist Chris Jordan is from a series titled Running the Numbers 2, Portraits of Global Mass Culture. Um, this is a series he did in 2009, and this particular work is titled Gear. And so it might look a little bit familiar to you because he's using Hakusai's great wave off the shore at Kanagawa to sort of highlight the idea of consumer waste. He has used 2.4 million pieces of plastic to reflect the number of pounds of plastic that are estimated to enter into the world's oceans every hour. Um, the plastic he used was collected from the Pacific Ocean, and he's named the work after the Pacific Gear, which is a 1,000 mile wide whirlpool which collects a huge amount of trash. Um, so he's trying to draw attention to the huge volumes of waste that humans create as a whole, but to also bring it to a more individualized level. Um, and he does this by incorporating familiar objects like toothbrushes, combs, etc. Um, now, Hokusai's original work is meant to emphasize the beauty and power of nature. Um, and here, Jordan references that to ask the viewer to consider whether or not that beauty and power can survive um, with the environmental issues that we have created. Um, the artist says, quote, the pervasiveness of our consumerism holds a seductive kind of mob mentality. Collectively, we are committing a vast and unsustainable act of taking, but we each are anonymous and no one is in charge or accountable for the consequences. I am appalled by these scenes and yet also drawn into them with awe and fascination. I find evidence of a slow motion apocalypse in progress. One of the most famous contemporary living artists who has suffered for their work and their opinions is the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei. Ai's father was a revered poet and a member of the ruling Communist Party, and Ai was involved in the design of the stadium for the Beijing Olympics in 2008. He was, therefore, in some ways, an establishment figure in China. But 2008 was also the year of a devastating earthquake in southwestern China, which killed at least 69,000 people and left 4.8 million homeless. Several schools collapsed due to poor construction, which the government tried to hide. I visited the sites, met with the parents, wrote a blog criticizing the government, and posted the names of the 5,385 children who died. In 2009, I made a memorial out of 9,000 brightly colored backpacks exhibited in Munich, Germany. The packs are arranged to spell out, quote, she lived happily for seven years in this world, a quote from a letter from a mourning mother who lost her child during this earthquake. Um, later in 2009, Ai Weiwei was beaten severely by the police, receiving injuries that required emergency brain surgery. In January 2011, Chinese government officials ordered the demolition of his studio, and in April, he was arrested for quote-unquote economic crimes. After serving 81 days in prison, he was not allowed to leave the country until 2015. Um, I believe he's currently living in England, and his work is typically banned from being shown in China. Um, I have included a few other examples of Ai Weiwei's work here, but you'll also learn um, a good deal more about him and his work and how he sort of uses it as a force of social activism in the film that you will watch and respond to this week. We have Ai Weiwei's Sunflower Seeds from 2010. Um, this was an installation at the Tate Modern in the Turbine Hall. It consisted of more than 100 million tiny handmade porcelain sunflower seeds. 
Now, these are an allusion to the communist propaganda of Mao Zedong. If you remember, we talked about him in a previous lecture, um, but he considered himself the sun and the citizens of the People's Republic of China as sunflowers. Now, sunflowers, when they are um, fully grown, they will turn to face the sun, regardless of where it is in the sky, so that they are receiving full sunlight. So he, uh, Mao Zedong, was implying that the people of China should turn toward him and look to him for guidance and kind of leadership, no matter what. Um, also, however, sunflower seeds were eaten even in the poorest parts of China during Ai Weiwei's childhood, during the Cultural Revolution of Mao Zedong. Um, and so even the poorest people could afford sunflower seeds. And in several interviews and things, Ai Weiwei discusses, um, you know, he remembers his childhood being rather rather poor and difficult, but he also remembers always having a pocket of sunflower seeds, um, and that was sort of his little snack and also his his pleasure um, for the day. Um, he also discusses how in many parts of China, a lot of adult Chinese people will have um, sort of a chip in one of their front teeth from cracking open sunflower seeds. That's how frequently they ate them. So these porcelain seeds were carefully made by more than 1600 artisans using molds and then hand painting them. Now, Ai Weiwei went to Jingdezhen, the porcelain capital of China um, and really of the world. Artists here have been producing pottery for more than 200 years, all the way back to the Han Dynasty. Um, this is where porcelain was originally invented and really porcelain is a symbol of Chinese culture. Um, so he hired artisans um, from Jingdezhen to produce these porcelain sunflower seeds as a way to connect to Chinese heritage and artistic traditions. So on April 3rd, 2011, Ai Weiwei was arrested while waiting for a flight to Hong Kong from Beijing. Now, this detention was broadly believed to be linked to his criticisms of the Chinese government. Um, just a few months prior to his arrest in February of 2011, um, a, a series of peaceful protests around China were led by another person, Jasmine Reyes, and I believe Ai Weiwei um, sort of spoke out in support of these peaceful protests, and then the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs declared him to be under investigation for alleged economic crimes, um, but that was probably not true. Um, However, the government destroyed his studio while he was imprisoned for several months. Um, this will be covered in the documentary, so you'll get to see some more details about that as well. In more recent years, Ai Weiwei has focused his practice on advocating for refugees' human rights. Um, he documents the experiences and conditions that millions of people who have been forcibly displaced from their homes are undergoing every day. Um, so this particular installation, Soleil Levant, from 2017, this is um, another installation 
at, let's see, this one is at the Konzerfaus Museum in Berlin. Um, so this consists of 14,000 life jackets installed um, on the six columns of the facade of the Berlin Concert Hall. Excuse me, I think I said museum a moment ago. Um, but Ai Weiwei collected these life jackets on the island of Lesbos, um, just off of Greece. And this island has often been used by Syrian refugees en route to Europe. Um, and so each life vest reflects the individual life of a man, woman, or child whose landing at Lesbos is just the beginning of their new life. Um, and so he's bringing attention to the refugee crisis and highlighting the countless lives that have been changed by it. Um, he said, there is no refugee crisis, only a human crisis. In dealing with ref refugees, we've lost our very basic values. In this time of uncertainty, we need more tolerance, compassion, and trust for each other. Since we are all one, otherwise humanity will face an even bigger crisis. Um, here is another angle, the same building, but now we're looking at the side. And so it has these faux kind of um, arched windows that he has also filled um, with additional life jackets. So no matter what side of the building you're on, you can see um, part of this installation. Um, and here we have a work titled Law of the Journey. Now this was installed at the um, 2018 Sydney Biennial. Um, this was a 60 foot inflatable boat crowned with hundreds of anonymous refugee figures. Um, and it sort of brings the monumental scale of this humanitarian crisis um, or the refugee crisis into focus. Now, this is created with the same black rubber um, and fabricated by the same factory that produces these little rubber lifeboats that are used by thousands of refugees attempting to cross the Mediterranean Sea. Um, now, the wallpaper in the room, um, he used photographs that he had taken on his iPhone while he was making a documentary in 2017 titled Human Flow. This documentary explores the refugee crisis on a global scale. Um, he moves beyond Syria and Europe and looks at Africa. He looks at South America and um, countless other regions as well. It's on Amazon Prime, I believe, if you're interested. I would definitely um, definitely encourage you to go watch it. But he also, at this particular um, exhibition, he played four video works um, that showed um, an overcrowded, inflatable raft delivering a constant flow of people to the shores of the Greek island of Lesbos. Um, they also show Ai Weiwei standing alone on a partially submerged inflatable vessel, uh, which was discovered floating in the Mediterranean, and the fates of its passengers remained unknown. Um, another video showed footage of the same raft abandoned to the seemingly limitless expanse of the ocean. Um, and then he also created a documentary film titled Ai Weiwei Drifting that follows Ai Weiwei over the course of one year um, as he created a series of works focusing on the refugee crisis. Art can inspire a forceful response, and when the ideas and artwork represents are considered harmful or incompatible with a desired message or point of view, artworks might be censored or removed from public eyes. We've already seen a few examples of this. First, with the removal of Richard Serra's Tilted Ark from the Federal Plaza in New York, and also with our discussion of iconoclasm in the war and healing chapter. Um, but let's look at a few other examples that are um, a bit more direct or specific. Because works of visual art can often cause such forceful emotional responses and even stir people into action, artworks and the artists that create them are often amongst the first to be targeted by dictators or extremist governments, and they're also some of the first victims in times of war. Um, censorship or the suppression or prohibition of a work of art has the ability to cause shifts in public opinion, and therefore these works are often censored by these extremist extremist leaders and governments. Um, 
For example, as a young man in his late teens, Adolf Hitler sold realistic watercolors and painted postcards on the streets of Vienna. However, he failed twice to be accepted into the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, an institution that did accept several artists with more abstract styles, including Egon Schiel. Um, Hitler really never got over the disappointment of being unable to become a successful artist, and he truly abhorred modern art, in particular that of the German Expressionists. In Germany in the 1930s, Hitler's National Socialist or Nazi regime launched a systematic and large-scale attack on modern art that did not conform to Nazi party goals. The Nazis initially confiscated around 5,000 works of art from museums, but they later took a further 16,500 works from private collections. Some 4,000 of these works were burned, while others became the property of Nazi collectors or were sold to foreign collectors for Nazi profit. The artists who made them were banned from working. The Nazis also dismissed museum directors, closed art schools, including the famous Bauhaus in Germany, and they burned thousands of books. On July 18, 1937, the Nazis opened an exhibition of, quote, great German art, which displayed the kind of art they approved of. Um, the next day, they opened another show, including 730 works. This show was called Degenerate Art, to suggest that these works were works of mentally deficient artists. Um, works were deliberately displayed awkwardly, and labels on the walls ridiculed the artworks. One such label read, quote, We act as if we were painters, poets, or whatever, but what we are is simply and aesthetically impudent. In our impudence, we take the world for a ride and train snobs to lick our boots. Artists targeted with this exhibition included Egon Schiel, Otto Dix, Paul Klee, Marc Chagall, Max Ernst, Pablo Picasso, Henri Matisse, and Vincent van Gogh. But one of the artists whose work was particularly ridiculed in this exhibition was Emile Nold. Um, he had a series of nine panels on the life of Christ that were hung together next to the writing on the wall that said, Mockery of the Divine. The crucifixion, which was the largest panel of the series, was placed in the center. Its unnaturally bright colors, the greenish pallor of Christ and the other figures, and the blurry, unfinished look of the paintings made them, in the eyes of the creators of the exhibition, anti-religious. However, unlike most of the artists that were mocked in this show, Emil Nold was himself a member of the Nazi party, and he was so appalled to see his artwork in the exhibition that he wrote to Paul Joseph Goebbels, who was the Nazi minister of propaganda, demanding that the defamation against him cease. Nold's paintings were eventually returned to him, but he was ordered to stop making art. He continued to create watercolors in secret, but he was afraid he would be discovered if he used strong smelling oil paints. Despite the constraints he was under, Nold was actually one of the lucky artists. Dozens of others whose work was featured in the show fled Germany or committed suicide, and many were later sent to concentration camps. Attendance at the Degenerate Art Exhibition was unparalleled for the time, and more than two million visitors came to the exhibition in Munich alone, and one million more went to the show while it was on tour through the rest of Germany and Austria. Although there are records of people spitting on the artworks, there remains little other evidence of what visitors actually thought of the art in this propaganda spectacle. When the exhibitions ended, the Nazis sold some of the artworks to raise money for their impending war effort, but most of the works were destroyed along with thousands of others considered degenerate. The freedom to create art and to have opinions about it are emblems of a peaceful society. The degenerate art show and the book burnings perpetuated by Nazis are two examples of how extreme censorship can result in the end of peace and freedom for many. Sometimes the impact of a work is so powerful that viewers wish to destroy it, along with the message or attitude they see represented within it. 
the Rokeby Venus or the Toilet of Venus by the Spanish artist Diego de Silva y Velázquez may seem inoffensive to the modern viewer, but in 1914 it was the target of a violent protest at the National Gallery in London. A woman named Mary Richardson, armed with a meat cleaver hidden inside her coat, slashed the Rokeby Venus seven times. Richardson was a member of the suffragette movement, which campaigned for women's right to vote. Um, for her, the painting represented a sexist definition of ideal beauty, showing a woman solely as an object of male desire. Richardson was more specifically protesting the imprisonment of a suffragette leader named Emmeline Pankhurst, and later explained that she believed justice to be more valuable than art, saying, quote, I have tried to destroy the picture of the most beautiful woman in mythological history as a protest against the government for destroying Miss Pankhurst, who is the most beautiful character in modern history, end quote. Richardson's attack on the painting did not have its intended effect on perceptions of the Rokeby Venus. The seven slashes were soon completely repaired, and many still consider the painting to be a defining representation of female sensuality and beauty. Richardson was imprisoned briefly after the attack, and the incident did not seem to help the suffragette movement either, although some women did gain the right to vote in Britain in 1918. For a while after the incident, however, women were forbidden to enter the National Gallery unless they were accompanied by a male chaperone. In 2002, when American artist Eric Fischel unveiled his bronze sculpture titled Falling Woman, which was intended as a tribute to the victims of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001 in New York City, it was considered so offensive that it was covered over almost immediately. The sculpture shows a woman in free fall with her legs above her head and her arms flailing. Fischl placed a poem next to the artwork which stated, We watched disbelieving and helpless on that savage day. People we love began falling helpless and in disbelief. Many New Yorkers had of course witnessed firsthand the tragedy of desperate victims who had been trapped in the World Trade Center towers, jumping to their deaths to escape the fire. Perhaps because of this, Fischl's sculpture, displayed only a year after the terrorist attack, was considered too potent and heart-wrenching. The artwork and the response to it reflect one of the challenges that artists face when they address contemporary issues. Would Fischl's sculpture have been accepted if it had been unveiled many years later when this event was no longer fresh in the minds of so many people? Or was it simply too graphic, depicting a moment too shocking and unbelievable for people to ever want to remember? On the other hand, some viewers were upset that the sculpture had been covered up, considering it a powerful reminder and a valid, even cathartic or emotionally releasing response to what had happened. The artist quoted, the sculpture was not meant to hurt anybody. It was a sincere expression of the deepest sympathy for the vulnerability of the human condition, both specifically towards the victims of September 11th and towards humanity in general. In recent years, Confederate monuments have become a frequent target of protest in the United States, leading to the removal of hundreds of statues. The Confederacy was composed of 11 southern states that seceded from the United States during the American Civil War between 1861 and 1865. At the end of the war, when the North and South again became a singular country, the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified, ending the practice of slavery. Many Southerners who lost loved ones in the war, as well as their way of life, continued to revere the Confederacy. However, it was not until decades later that Confederate monuments began to appear, coinciding with the implementation of Jim Crow laws that enforced racial segregation. Today, while some view these monuments as honoring their ancestors and Southern society, others associate them with the institution of enslavement and see them as a glorification of racial inequality. The Robert E. Lee Monument in Richmond, Virginia, an equestrian statue of the Confederate general, has been appropriated as a gathering place for expressing African American rights. The 45-foot tall base has been covered with graffiti, particularly after the killing of George Floyd in May 2020. In the evenings, Dustin Klein and other artists projected images of George Floyd and other important African Americans, such as pioneer of the civil rights movement and longtime member of the U.S. House of Representatives, John Lewis, as seen here. 
Um, the letters BLM, signifying Black Lives Matter, shine on the sculpted horse's body. Um, this sculpture has since been removed. Um, it was removed in September of 2021.